The king, motionless with horror, looked on despairingly at this dreadful occurrence which he was quite powerless to prevent. And to make matters worse, his sight failed him. Everything became dark, and he felt himself carried along through the air by a strong hand. This new misfortune was the work of the wicked fairy of the desert, who had come with the yellow dwarf to help him carry off the princess, and had fallen in love with the handsome young king in the gold mines directly she saw him. She thought that if she carried him off to some frightful cavern and chained him to a rock, then the fear of death would make him forget Bellissima and become her slave. So, as soon as they reached the place, she gave him back his sight, but without releasing him from his chains, and by her magic power she appeared before him as a young and beautiful fairy, and pretended to have come there quite by chance. "'What do I see?' she cried. "'Is it you, dear prince? What misfortune has brought you to this dismal place?' The king, who was quite deceived by her altered appearance, replied, "'Alas!' The beautiful fairy, the fairy who brought me here first, took away my sight, but by her voice I recognized her as the fairy of the desert, though what she should have carried me off for I cannot tell you. Ah, cried the pretended fairy, if you have fallen into her hands, you won't get away until you have married her. She has carried off more than one prince like this, and she will certainly have anything she takes a fancy to. While she was thus pretending to be sorry for the king, he suddenly noticed her feet, which were like those of a griffin, and knew in a moment that this must be the fairy of the desert, for her feet were the one thing she could not change, however pretty she might make her face. Without seeming to have noticed anything, he said in a confidential way, Not that I have any dislike for the fairy of the desert, but I really cannot endure the way in which she protects the yellow dwarf, and keeps me chained here like a criminal. It is true that I love a charming princess, but if the fairy should set me free, my gratitude will oblige me to love her only. Do you really mean what you say, prince? said the fairy, quite deceived. Surely, replied the prince, how could I deceive you? You see, it is so much more flattering to my vanity to be loved by a fairy than by a simple princess. But even I am dying of love for her. I shall pretend to hate her until I am set free. The fairy of the desert, quite taken in by these words, resolved at once to transport the prince to a pleasanter place. So making him mount her chariot, to which she had harnessed swans instead of the bats which generally drew it, away she flew with him. But imagine the distress of the prince when, from the giddy height at which they were rushing through the air, he saw his beloved princess in a castle built of polished steel, the walls of which reflected the sun rays so hotly that no one could approach it without being burned to a cinder. Bellissima was sitting in the thicket by a brook, leaning her head upon her hand and weeping bitterly. But just as they passed, she looked up and saw the king and the fairy of the desert, now the fairy was so clever that she could not only seem beautiful to the king, but even the poor princess thought her the most lovely being that she had ever seen. What? she cried. Was I not unhappy enough in this lonely castle, to which that frightful yellow dwarf brought me? Must I also be made to know that the king of the gold mines ceased to love me as soon as he lost sight of me? But who can my rival be? whose fatal beauty is greater than mine. While she was saying this, the king, who really loved her as much as ever, was feeling terribly sad at being so rapidly torn away from his beloved princess. But he knew too well how powerful the fairy was to have any hope of escaping from her, except by great patience and cunning. The fairy of the desert had also seen Bellissima, and she tried to read in the king's eyes the effect that this unexpected sight had had upon him. No one can tell you what you wish to know better than I can, said he. This chance meeting with an unhappy princess for whom I once had a passing fancy, before I was lucky enough to meet you, has affected me a little, I admit. But you are so much more to me than she is, that I would rather die than leave you. Ah, prince, she said. Can I believe that you really love me so much? 
time will show, madam, replied the king, but if you wish to convince me that you have some regard for me, do not, I beg of you, refuse to aid Bellissima. Do you know what you are asking? said the fairy of the desert, frowning and looking at him suspiciously. Do you want me to employ my art against the yellow dwarf, who is my best friend, and take away from him a proud princess, whom I can but look upon as a rival? The king sighed, but made no answer. Indeed, what was there to be said to such a clear-sighted person? At last they reached a vast meadow, gay with all sorts of flowers. A deep river surrounded it, and many little brooks murmured softly under the shady trees, where it was always cool and fresh. A little way off stood a splendid palace, the walls of which were of transparent emeralds. As soon as the swans which drew the fairy's chariot had alighted under a porch which was paved with diamonds and had arches of rubies, they were greeted on all sides by thousands of beautiful beings, who came to meet them joyfully singing these words. When love within a heart would reign, useless to strive against him tis, the proud but feel a sharper pain, and make a greater triumph his. The fairy of the desert was delighted to hear them sing of her triumphs. She led the king into the most splendid room that can be imagined, and left him alone for a little while, just that he might not feel that he was a prisoner. But he felt sure that she had not really gone quite away, but was watching him from some hiding place. So walking up to a great mirror, he said to it, Trusty counselor, let me see what I can do to make myself agreeable to the charming fairy of the desert, for I can think of nothing but how to please her. And he at once set to work to curl his hair, and seeing upon a table a grander coat than his own, he put it on carefully. The fairy came back so delighted that she could not conceal her joy. I am quite aware of the trouble you have taken to please me, said she, and I must tell you that you have succeeded perfectly already. You see, it is not difficult to do if you really care for me. The king, who had his own reasons for wishing to keep the old fairy in a good humor, did not spare pretty speeches, and after a time he was allowed to walk by himself upon the seashore. The fairy of the desert had, by her enchantments, raised such a terrible storm that the boldest pilot would not venture out in it, so she was not afraid of her prisoners being able to escape, and he found it some relief to think sadly over his terrible situation without being interrupted by his cruel captor. Presently, after walking wildly up and down, he wrote these verses upon the sand with his stick. At last may I upon this shore lighten my sorrow with soft tears. Alas, alas, I see no more my love who yet my sadness cheers. And thou, O raging stormy sea, Stirred by wild winds from depth to height, Thou holdest my loved one far from me, And I am captive to thy might. My heart is still more wild than thine, For fate is cruel unto me. Why must I thus in exile pine? Why is my princess snatched from me? O oh, lovely nymphs from ocean caves, Who know how sweet true love may be, Come up and calm the furious waves, and set my desperate lover free. While he was still writing, he heard a voice which attracted his attention in spite of himself. Seeing that the waves were rolling in higher and higher, he looked all around and presently saw a lovely lady floating gently toward him upon the crest of a huge billow. Her long hair spread all about her. In one hand she held a mirror and in the other a comb, and instead of feet she had a beautiful tail like a fish, with which she swam. The king was struck dumb with astonishment at this unexpected sight, but as soon as she came within speaking distance she said to him, I know how sad you are at losing your princess, and being kept a prisoner by the fairy of the desert. If you like, I will help you to escape from this fatal place 
where you may otherwise have to drag on a weary existence for thirty years or more. The king of the gold mines hardly knew what answer to make to this proposal. Not because he did not wish very much to escape, but he was afraid that this might be only another device by which the fairy of the desert was trying to deceive him. As he hesitated, the mermaid, who guessed his thoughts, said to him, You may trust me, I am not trying to entrap you. I am so angry with the yellow dwarf and the fairy of the desert that I am not likely to wish to help them, especially since I constantly see your poor princess, whose beauty and goodness make me pity her so much. And I tell you that if you will have confidence in me, I will help you to escape. I trust you absolutely, cried the king, and I will do whatever you tell me. But if you have seen my princess, I beg of you to tell me how she is and what is happening to her. We must not waste time in talking, said she. Come with me and I will carry you to the castle of steel, and we will leave upon this shore a figure so like you that even the fairy herself will be deceived by it. So saying, she quickly collected a bundle of seaweed, and blowing it three times, she said, My friendly seaweeds, I order you to stay here stretched upon the sand until the fairy of the desert comes to take you away. And at once the seaweeds became like the king, who stood looking at them in great astonishment, for they were even dressed in a coat like his, but they lay there pale and still as the king himself might have lain, if one of the great waves had overtaken him and thrown him senseless upon the shore. And then the mermaid caught up the king, and away they swam joyfully together. Now, said she, I have time to tell you about the princess. In spite of the blow which the fairy of the desert gave her, the yellow dwarf compelled her to mount behind him upon his terrible Spanish cat. But she soon fainted away with pain and terror, and did not recover till they were within the walls of his frightful castle of steel. Here she was received by the prettiest girls it was possible to find, who had been carried there by the yellow dwarf, who hastened to wait upon her and showed her every possible attention. She was laid upon a couch covered with cloth of gold, embroidered with pearls as big as nuts. Ah, interrupted the king of the gold mines, if Bellissima forgets me, and consents to marry him, I shall break my heart. You need not be afraid of that, answered the mermaid. The princess thinks of no one but you, and the frightful dwarf cannot persuade her to look at him. Pray go on with your story, said the king. What more is there to tell, replied the mermaid. Bellissima was sitting in the wood when you passed and saw you with a fairy of the desert, who was so cleverly disguised that the princess took her to be prettier than herself. You may imagine her despair, for she thought that you had fallen in love with her. She believes that I love her? cried the king. What a fatal mistake! What is to be done to undeceive her? You know best, answered the mermaid, smiling kindly at him. When people are in as much love as one another as you two are, they don't need advice from anyone else. As she spoke, they reached the castle of steel, the side next to the sea being the only one which the yellow dwarf had left unprotected by the dreadful burning walls. I know quite well, said the mermaid, that the princess is sitting by the brookside, just where you saw her as you passed. But as you will have many enemies to fight with before you can reach her, take this sword. Armed with it, you may dare any danger and overcome the greatest difficulties. Only beware of one thing, that is, never to let it fall from your hand. Farewell. Now I will wait by that rock, and if you need my help in carrying off your beloved princess, I will not fail you. For the queen, her mother, is my best friend and it was for her sake that I went to rescue you. So saying, she gave to the king a sword made of a single diamond, which was more brilliant than the sun. He could not find words to express his gratitude, but he begged her to believe that he fully appreciated the importance of her gift, and would never forget her help and kindness. 
we must now go back to the fairy of the desert. When she found that the king did not return, she hastened out to look for him, and reached the shore with a hundred of the ladies of her train, loaded with splendid presents for him. Some carried baskets full of diamonds, other golden cups of wonderful workmanship, and amber, coral, and pearls. Others, again, balanced upon their heads bales of the richest and most beautiful stuffs, while the rest brought fruit and flowers and even birds. But what was the horror of the fairy, who followed this gay troop when she saw stretched upon the sands the image of the king which the mermaid had made with the seaweeds? Struck with astonishment and sorrow, she uttered a terrible cry, and threw herself down beside the pretended king, weeping and howling and calling upon her eleven sisters, who were also fairies, who came to her assistance. But they were all taken in by the image of the king, for clever as they were, the mermaid was still cleverer. And all they could do was to help the fairy of the desert to make a wonderful monument over what they thought was the grave of the king of the gold mines. But while they were collecting jasper and porphyry, agate and marble, gold and bronze, statues and devices to immortalize the king's memory, he was thanking the good mermaid and begging her still to help him, which she graciously promised to do as she disappeared. And then he set out for the castle of steel. He walked fast, looking anxiously round him, and longing once more to see his darling Bellissima. But he had not gone far before he was surrounded by four terrible sphinxes, who would very soon have torn him to pieces with their sharp talons if it had not been for the mermaid's diamond sword. For no sooner had he flashed it before their eyes than down they fell at his feet quite helpless, and he killed them with one blow. But he had hardly turned to continue his search when he met six dragons covered with scales that were harder than iron. Frightful as this encounter was, the king's courage was unshaken, and by the aid of his wonderful sword he cut them in pieces one after the other. Now he hoped his difficulties were over, but at the next turning he was met by one which he did not know how to overcome. Four and twenty pretty and graceful nymphs advanced toward him, holding garlands of flowers, with which they barred the way. "'Where are you going, Prince?' they said. "'It is our duty to guard this place, and if we let you pass, great misfortunes will happen to you and us.' We beg you not to insist upon going on. Do you want to kill four and twenty girls who have never displeased you in any way? The king did not know what to do or to say. But as he hesitated, a voice in his ear said, Strike, strike, and do not spare, or your princess is lost forever. So, without reply to the nymphs, he rushed forward instantly, breaking the garlands and scattering them in all directions and then went on without further hindrance to the little wood where he had seen Bellissima. She was seated by the brook looking pale and weary when he reached her, and he would have thrown himself down at her feet, but she drew herself away from him with as much indignation as if he had been the yellow dwarf. "'Ah, princess!' he cried. "'Do not be angry with me. Let me explain everything. I am not faithless or to blame for what has happened. I am a miserable wretch who has displeased you without being able to help myself. Ah, cried Bellissima, did I not see you flying through the air with the loveliest being imaginable? Was that against your will? Indeed it was, princess, he answered. The wicked fairy of the desert, not content with chaining me to a rock, carried me off in her chariot to the other end of the earth, where I should even now be a captive but for the unexpected help of a friendly mermaid, who brought me here to rescue you, my princess, from the unworthy hands that hold you. Do not refuse the aid of your most faithful lover. So saying, he threw himself at her feet and held her by her robe. But, alas, in so doing he let fall the magic sword, and the yellow dwarf who was crouching behind a lettuce no sooner saw it than he sprang out and seized it well knowing its wonderful power the princess gave a cry of terror on seeing the dwarf but this only irritated the little monster 
Muttering a few magical words, he summoned two giants who bound the king with great chains of iron. Now, said the dwarf, I am master of my rival's fate, but I will give him his life and permission to depart unharmed if you, princess, will consent to marry me. Let me die a thousand times rather, cried the unhappy king. Alas, cried the princess, must you die? Could anything be more terrible? That you should marry that little wretch would be far more terrible, answered the king. At least, continued she, let us die together. Let me have the satisfaction of dying for you, my princess, said he. Oh, no, no, she cried, turning to the dwarf, rather than I will do as you wish. Cruel princess, said the king, would you make my life horrible to me by marrying another before my eyes? Not so, replied the yellow dwarf. You are a rival of whom I am too much afraid. You shall not see our marriage. So saying, in spite of Bellissima's tears and cries, he stabbed the king to the heart with a diamond sword. The poor princess, seeing her lover lying dead at her feet, could no longer live without him. She sank down by him and died of a broken heart. So ended these unfortunate lovers, whom not even the mermaid could help because all the magic power had been lost with a diamond sword. As for the wicked dwarf, he preferred to see the princess dead rather than marry to the king of the gold mines, and the fairy of the desert, when she heard of the king's adventures, pulled down the grand monument which she had built, and was so angry at the trick that had been played her, that she hated him as much as she had loved him before. The kind mermaid, grieved at the sad fate of the lovers, caused them to be changed into two palm trees which stand always side by side, whispering together of their faithful love and caressing one another with their interlacing branches. End of story. Recording by Ed Good.